Having just sung that truth will triumph, I invite you to join me now in corporate confession. Almighty God, you despise nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are repentant. Great in us with contrite hearts that are truly repenting of our sins, acknowledge our brokenness. We may obtain from you, the God of all mercy, whole heart, and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, to your who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and I want to invite any children forward to come have a seat for the children's moment with me. I know I'm not Pastor Judith. I'm sorry. I know she's more fun. Hello. Come have a seat. Hey, 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 Clyde. Hey, Amelia. Awesome. Can you all tell me your names? Because my name's Evan. What's your name, sweetie? Catherine. Catherine. Amelia. Clyde, awesome. Well, good. Thank you so much for coming down to sit with me. So I thought that I was going to talk to you guys today about prayer. And then I found out, did Pastor Judith talk to you guys about prayer last week? Yeah. Yes. Do you remember everything that she told you, though? Go ahead. I heard about that going to a vacation. Yeah. She's on vacation. Isn't that so great? It's good. It's good to take time to rest. So we're going to just be real short, real sweet. We're going to do, think of it as prayer part two, because I planned this whole long, long children's sermon, and then I found out, oh my gosh, Pastor Judith already talked to them about prayer. They must be experts. Do you guys feel like experts on prayer? Maybe a shake or a nod. It's all right. I'll let you a secret. I don't feel like an expert on prayer at all. And so what I wanted to share was a little secret with you all, is for times that you don't feel like an expert at praying, which for me is all the time, I want to share two little extra secrets that you can do that maybe Pastor Judith has already told you, or maybe she didn't tell you at all. So the first one is sometimes when you pray, if you don't know what to pray, you don't have to say anything at all. Just like when you're hanging out with your friends, sometimes you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, and sometimes you're just sitting there and enjoying each other's company. So prayer, you can sit and do nothing at all and just be quiet with God and just enjoy God's company. And the other little secret I wanted to share with you when you're not feeling like an expert at prayer at all is you can, you can cheat. 
You can use a book. So there's lots of books. I brought this one. It's called the Book of Common Prayer. I like this one, but there's all sorts of ones. There's ones for little kids, big kids, old kids, young kids, and they have prayers in them to help you. So if there's ever a time where you know, I want to talk to God, but I don't know what to say to God, you can also use somebody else to help you. So it's totally okay if you don't feel like an expert on prayer, even though Pastor Judith told you about prayer last week, I'll get to you in a second, and even though I'm telling you about prayer today, it's okay if you still feel like you don't know how to do it and you can find other people who can help you. What was your question? Go ahead. Wow, that's wonderful. So that's all I wanted to share with you, boys and girls. Can we pray together really quick? Since we're talking about prayer, we should probably pray, and then you guys can head back and sit with your, sit with your families. Does that sound good? All right, I'll pray for us today. Dear God, thank you for this time. Thank you for boys and girls that they can come and sit and think about you. And Lord, we thank you that we can, we can pray in so many different ways. God, we can pray in silence, we can pray by reading, we can pray by making something up. We just are thankful that you want to know us. In your son's name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming down, guys. Go ahead. This morning, I just have two quick announcements for you. The first one, you may have seen a table of pussy willow branches out front. Those are there for you to take, do whatever you want to do with them, decorate your lawn, your house, enjoy them. Those have been donated that you can enjoy. The next is following the service today, they're doing a make and take, as well as there's a potato bar. So come down, eat, make a craft, it's going to be a great time. That's in Fellowship Hall today. Everything else, you can check your bulletins. In October of 2012, Sandy, Hurricane Sandy created havoc in, in New York City. Thousands of people were displaced. They were living in total darkness. There was no electricity. We used to go down to the Jersey Shore, you know, a couple of times during the summer. And you know, you'd see things like there was a roller coaster in the water. And it's weird because I remember riding that roller coaster with my sister. We would drive down the street and you could turn to the side and on the beach side and you'd see the mailboxes in the driveways and then you'd just see nothing because the house was totally gone. You know it is our responsibility, your God-given responsibility to go out and, and help. And PDA stepped in, they were first responders, they came to our city, they, they were able to assess firsthand what, what was going on. PD has been in this business for a long time, so they came in, they knew exactly what, what, what to do, and they were looking for host sites. Fortunately, our church has um, our facilities, and we thought that it was an ideal center to set up a hosting site, and our session agreed that, hey, since we have these facilities, let's do it. Our church is no different from any other church. We go out on mission trips. We have lot mission teams go out. One family that we helped move back into their house, we actually got to know them and talk to them. The homeowner came back. She walked through the door and just broke into tears. <laughs> they were happy tears. This was about sort of the restoration of these people's lives and getting them back into their, their homes and back into their regular lives. To us, we were just helping another family move back in, but to them it was just this group of people that really cared and I feel like they just saw God in us that kind of opened my eyes, kind of made me have hope and I'm glad we made them feel like they had hope that everything will get better. We ask you to support this one with our, our sharing offering. This offering goes to help those in need. It goes to help people.
people that have been affected by disasters around the world. It's going to help the people who need the help the most and, and it's going to bring hope to the hopeless. share all my sorrows. You said you'd be there for all my tomorrows. I came so close to sending you away, but just like you promised, came there to stay I just had to goodness so great I can't understand and dear Lord I know that all this was planned I know you're here now and always will be your love
Our scripture reading today, <clears throat> excuse me, our scripture reading today is from Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 40. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time for their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after marriage and then as a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were there looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, their own town of Nazareth. The word of the Lord. I don't know if you have picked up yet from my wonderful sultry voice that I'm recovering from a sickness, so I hope you don't mind if I sit today while I preach. I also wanted to sit a little bit because I really... All I want to do today, all I want to accomplish as a group, is I want to just wonder about the text that was read aloud. I want to wonder what's going on with Simeon. Why does he pick Jesus up and start singing? Why does Anna get all excited and run out the temple singing when this baby is just brought in, this child? Really quick, though, I want to talk about me, because who doesn't love talking about themselves? Um, just a quick little introduction. Uh, my name's Evan. I was here for nine years. I was the youth director here. I'm currently in seminary, so I left Supli to uh, seek ordination, as well as I'm working at Penn right now as a chaplain. And so, Supli, you all are still my sponsoring session. On uh, this past Thursday, I went before the, um, the COM, so the ordination board, and they moved me to like the next level. So I'm now a candidate. In next March, I should hopefully be ordained and ready to uh, find a church to work at. Uh, this coming September, I'm starting a role with East Falls Presbyterian Church. So if you're ever in the city on a Sunday morning and you want to see a familiar face starting in September, it'd be great to see you pop in at East Falls Pres. So that's just kind of where I'm at, what I've been doing since I left Supli. So let's go back to the text. Let's go back to 2,000 years ago 
and this weird guy, Simeon, right? Like it's this very like a stranger danger kind of text. And it, it's had me thinking a lot about fear. So I do think, I think that Luke 2 exists in our Bible to confirm Jesus as Messiah, right? Like if you can follow with the text, Jesus was at home, they were going through the purification rites, he hadn't gone anywhere. He steps out, you have Simeon, he confirms, hey, this is the Messiah. But if you strip away all of the prophetic, all of the messianic from Luke 2, I think you find a lot about fear. I think you find two parents who are afraid, right? Like you have two parents who are stepping into a religious space, right? And then everyone goes bonkers. There's two prophets present when they get to the temple. One of them grabs their child without asking, and he starts singing, right? Like I can't imagine how unnerving of an experience Luke 2.28 would be if you're a parent, to just have a prophet snap up your child and start singing over them, right? There's fear going on in this text. My daughter just turned five this year, pretty crazy. So my little girl's going to kindergarten in September, and I'm afraid, right? Parenting is filled with fear. I'm afraid of the person that I have built in my little bubble of my safe little home, right? When she steps out of the bubble that her mother and I have built, when I put her on that school bus, oof, who else is gonna be on that school bus? And I bring these fears with me when I go to church. I think all parents, everyone, human beings bring fear when they go to church. So Luke presents us with two parents who go way above and beyond their religious obligations, right? Like I did some digging in some Jewish sources. Jesus did not have to be presented at the temple. Moses only requires the two birds. There is no requirement to then go and further dedicate this baby. So why did they do it? Right? What answers could we come up with if we just lean into our humanity, our own brokenness, our own fear? Why do we ever go above our religious obligations? What if we just imagine Mary and Joseph at home for a moment, kind of confused and fearful, right? Like an angel told them that they're the parents of the divine. That's probably the most terrifying thing in existence. Right, like what does that actually mean? Imagine being told, hey, by the way, you have to raise the Messiah, good luck. My kids aren't even divine and I worry every day about messing them up. I couldn't imagine being like, wow, if I do the wrong thing with this kid, does that mean Israel's no longer redeemed? If I lose him at the mall, does that mean Israel's doomed? Right? Like, imagine actually being the mother of the divine. Right? I have this ironclad view of Mary. She's like this echelon of femininity, right? This powerhouse woman who gave birth, chilling with some sheep and a camel, right? Like, she's a powerhouse. And then we just kind of tuck Mary away, and then we bring her back out at Easter, right? Or at Good Friday, and we have this ironclad Mary standing at the foot of the cross, not even shedding a tear, as Jesus dies. I don't know where that picture of Mary came from. Mary is the mother of Jesus, but Mary is a mother. I think Mary is afraid of what's going to happen to her little boy now that his purification rites are over. Imagine the conversation of Mary and Joseph at home. His rituals are done. Now he can be free. What do you think about should we even let him? I wish he was still a baby. I liked it better when we were doing our purification time. I'm not ready for him to go. I wish God would protect him. Do you think he's even divine? What if we took him to the temple one more time? What if we presented him? It worked for Samuel and Hannah. What could it hurt? Let's give it a try. I promise, as much as this might feel like a sermon on parenting, it's a sermon on fear. 
everyone is afraid of something. I just happen at this moment to be a parent who is afraid of sending my child to kindergarten. Mary and Joseph just happen to be scared parents who are raising the divine child. We all come to church wrestling with the dichotomy of realities of cultural messaging while looking for answers to all of our fears, right? Maybe you're wondering about how much money is in the 401k. Maybe you're wondering about moving. Maybe you're wondering about if your grandkids are happy. Maybe you're wondering about your own purpose, your own marriage, whatever makes you nervous. Is there gonna be enough gas in the car to go to work? Is the dinner I'm gonna to make today gonna to taste good or am I gonna burn it? You can be afraid of anything. Now, I'm not gonna give you one of the Christian taglines here, right? Like one of those, like, don't lean on your own understanding, or you can be anxious about nothing, give it over to God. I've only been a chaplain at Penn for seven months, but one thing that I learned is Christian taglines don't work when you're in a hospital bed. They're not super comforting when disaster shows up. I do think that trusting God through our fears is very important. But let's return to the text and look at what they do. Again, a human reading of the text where we see two clueless parents trying to raise the divine. They step into church, and then in their fear, in their wondering, a man walks up to them, and this is what he says. Behold, this child is appointed for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and as a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul to the end that thoughts from your hearts may be revealed. What actually is that? Why would Simeon do that? What in the world does that mean? To me, that is the most infuriating, like why in the world would Simeon walk up to these parents and tell them, a sword's gonna pierce your own soul so that your thoughts may be revealed. I got super stuck on the sword while I was preparing for this sermon. I was a youth pastor here. I've spoken to so many parents in churches. I've never told any of them, hey, your child's like a sword and he's going to cut your soul. But that's what the Bible text tells us. I got so stuck on this idea of a sword that I was wondering, like, is this just like a common cultural motif? Is it like the lingo of his day? Is this just like Simeon says this to everybody? Like, swords are out there. They're going to get you. I don't know. So there is this thing, it was called the Sword of Damocles. It was this philosophical term, it was made, made popular by the Roman philosopher Cicero in 45 BC, but really he just stole it from the Greeks. This thinker, Diordus. So I'm just throwing this out here. I don't know if Simeon read Diordus, but it's more just probably it was a common thing. And so for the Sword of Damocles, it was like a philosophical thought experiment. And the idea was that you have a sword poised over your head, hanging by a thread. It was intended to keep you on edge. It kept you from relaxing. It kept you from enjoying. It kept you fearful. Cicero kind of said, hey, to be rich was like having a sword hanging by a thread. Because you really couldn't enjoy your money, everyone wanted to take your money and wanted to gun you down. There was like the sword of Damocles was hanging by a thread. But Simeon's sword is different in one very crucial detail. See, Damocles' sword is hanging by a thread. Simeon will. There's no thread. There's no if. And that's the way that the prophet is different than the philosopher. Simeon says, this sword will pierce. And I'm still stuck on that. I don't know why it's in our biblical text. He says, the sword will pierce your soul and reveal what is going on in your heart. Well, what's going on in my heart? What's going on in all of our hearts? What's at the root of our fears? Right? Like Simeon goes straight to the heart when he looks at these parents 
who are going above and beyond and doing their little temple presentation. He says, hey, I get it. You're raising the divine child. Guess what? It's going to be awful. Seems to be what he's telling them. I think Simeon's asking me, do I believe in the providence of God enough to put my child on a school bus? And I don't know if I do. Right? Like, that doesn't tie up into a cute theological bow, but in my lived Christianity, it finds, it's really painful to find a breaking point, right? Where my faith has met its match and fear is currently winning. What about our fears, right? It's a plea. Y'all are a community in transition. Don left in 2021. You've been a community in transition for three years. Transition is hard. Transition is scary. And then we found some short-term stability in Judith. But Judith is leaving. If there is not fear in this place, y'all would be robots. I'm afraid that Judith is leaving. I'm not even here. Like Mary and Joseph, you are faced with the impossibly unclear task of raising the divine. Instead of a divine baby, you have the divine church. You, in this moment, are responsible for Supli. Right? We don't have Judas' tenderness or Don's longevity. We have ourselves. I think fear is knowing what you have to face and also knowing that it's you that has to face it. So do you think if Simeon was here and he saw us as a collective Mary, do you think he'd change his answer? Do you think he'd give us a new speech, a pep talk, or do you think he'd bust down his sword again? This is my imagination, right? I really want to imagine a Simeon who says something different, but I don't, because he goes straight to the heart. And again, I want to stress, this is my imagination, because I'm adding to the text. So imagine if Supli, not as a church that has existed in this community for over 50 years, but imagine today that Supli is a child, a child who has just finished its purification and its nervous parents take it to the temple one more time, right? We're all nervous. We all have our conversation with Joseph, and we say, let's take this church to the temple one more time. And a weird old man is here, and he scoops up Supli in his arms, and he says, behold, this church is appointed for the fall and rise of many. A sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. It's not comforting at all, is it? It's horrible. I don't even know if that's encouraging. I know that all of a sudden, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want my own soul pierced. I don't want y'all to know what's in my heart. I don't want my heart revealed. That is pain. Simeon provides a promise of pain. And I don't like it. Pain is everywhere. Leading a church without a full-time installed pastor is painful. So I've been thinking and thinking, why does Simeon do this? Why does he see two people who are afraid, or in our imagination, see a congregation that's afraid, and instead of giving encouragement, he promises pain, right? So this is my thought on fear and why Simeon does this. We have a belief or an idea of comfort. Fear, then, is the possibility that something could ruin that ideal. What if Simeon steps up to Mary and Joseph to remove their fears? And he doesn't remove their fears by guaranteeing comfort. He removes their fears by guaranteeing pain. He says, parenting this kid is going to be awful. You don't have to fe be fearful of what is to come because it's coming. 
he takes the sword of Damocles and he removes the string. I don't want to claim that Simeon knew the cross was coming. I don't think he did. But I do think he knew that pain and difficulty were coming. If he were holding the child Supli in his arms, I think he would say the exact same thing. Not to predict some demise of this church. Y'all are going to find somebody. You are. I know the uh, search committee is working hard. But to tell you there's going to be discomfort, and it's on its way as you raise this church. Please join me in prayer. God, we're thankful and we're angry that you pushed Simeon in front of us, Lord. Simeon is difficult, God, because he tells us that you are real, and yet he tells us that following you is painful. God, Simeon does not let us be complacent. Instead, he makes promises of peril. God, we pray that you would comfort our congregation as we transition. We pray that you would comfort this congregation as we wonder, as we look, as we search. God, we pray for the right person or people or whomever. Lord, we pray for someone who can see simply for who it is. We pray for ourselves as we lead, for all the bruised and rubbed elbows as we run into each other, as we try to become pastors to support this transition. God, we want you here in our midst. We beg, we demand, we implore that you care, that you love, that you see us through. God, we thank you that you are bigger than Simeon, that unlike Simeon, you promise more than pain. You promise deliverance. God, you promise deliverance. Now let us pray together as you taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. I know I went out of order. We still have a praise song to do. <laughs> Don't worry.
If you want to think about fear, imagine putting money in the plate in today's economy. As the offering comes forward, I encourage you to give as you are able and give as you feel led. Nauseous may come forward. Please pray with me. God, it is well. It is well with our souls. We're, Lord, we pray to be well with these offerings. You use them for our church, for our kingdom, for your glory. We trust you. Amen.
For today's benediction, we'll use Jesus' send-off from the Gospel of John. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Amen. Amen.